Hello and welcome to this video on effective remote data interpretation using LibreView. We do hope that you find it useful. Please share your thoughts in the comments section and make sure that you subscribe so that you don't miss any new content that we upload. Good afternoon, my name is Hope Frost and on behalf of SBK Healthcare, I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar on effective remote data interpretation using LibreView. I would like to thank Abbott for kindly sponsoring this webinar. It is now my pleasure to introduce your webinar chair, Professor Ramsey Ajan. Um, so um, I've, be, I've been asked to chair this meeting and I I'm, I'm feel very privileged to do so. And I think we're going to have a lovely 60 minutes coming up. Um, and the plan is to let Ian talk. So Ian Cranston is going to give the presentation. And I've known Ian for quite a few years and he's one of the most enthusiastic presenters I've ever seen. And I, I really enjoy listening to him. And, and this particular topic I think is important for every, everybody, particularly in these times. So the plan is to listen to Ian and then after that, we'll have questions. And please do have as many questions as possible. So I'll be um, going through them and um, we'll be discussing them at the end. So without wasting any more time, I'm going to hand over to Ian to tell us all about effective remote data interpretation with the LibreView. So um, what I'm doing, um, going aim to do today is to talk pretty specifically about how to get the most out of LibreView and in particular how to get the most out of LibreView in that clinical process that we've been um, sort of forced towards over the course of the last uh, few months, which is this issue around virtual or remote consulting. Um, I have declarations which relate to talks that I've done before and to uh, various organisations that I'm uh, part of, some of which will become relevant as we go on. Um, and I think it's probably worth mentioning for those of you that don't know that this is the second in a series of three um, webinars uh, looking at virtual consulting. Um, the first was done uh, by Prof Pratik Chowdhury. Um, who I think did it about two weeks ago now. Um, and I'm sure that as part of your uh, bits and pieces from um, SBK, they will send you a link to the recording of, of that if you didn't see it live. Um, and then the third is going to be done, I think in a week or two's time by my colleague Emma Wilmot uh, from Derby, um, who's going to be talking specifically about time in range and the time in range consensus process and, and how we use that to best effect over uh, um, use of CGM data. Um, but what my role today is, is to talk specifically about using data interpretation and specifically around using LibreView. And so what I would like to do is to talk uh, just for a couple of minutes about principles of data interpretation. So I'm not aiming to do a lot about the principles on this time, but really aiming to talk specifically about LibreView itself, the ins and outs of using it, and hopefully some tips and tricks that will help for us all to be slightly more effective users as time goes by. But then using this idea of a, of a structured approach to data with some examples to try and help to clarify that process. That's my aim anyway. So kicking straight off, um, CGM data uh, I think is very powerful for a number of reasons. It can be validated, which of course is something which SMBG data is often quite difficult to do. Because it's collected continuously, it doesn't have any bias in its collection in the same way that SMBG does. And of course, from CGM data, we can, we can determine the full experience uh, of someone's uh, glucose profile, looking at both their risk of having excess uh, glucose exposure, which we know is certainly the driver of a lot of our microvascular complications in diabetes, but also looking at uh, risks for specific episodes of hypo or hyperglycemia, looking at the instability that occurs in, in, in an individual day, and looking at the variability between days, and so working out how we best um, adapt those to produce um, the most comfortable profile for an individual with diabetes. And of course, the way we see all that data is in a variety of different presentations. 
So the simplest presentation is the one that's um, on the screen, either of the reader or of the phone, if that's what the individual is using as their reader, which is this number, arrow and line, number being now, arrow being the last 15 minutes in the direction of travel in that time and line being the last um, six to eight hours. But of course, we can also look at individual days, um, as uh, we can see with these two profiles, and we can look at areas which repeat and areas which don't repeat. And clearly, there's uh, lots of information in just looking at these two days of data that might be very useful in consultation. But what I'm going to talk most about, perhaps, is the ambulatory glucose profile, uh, which is this summative projection, looking usually at around about 14 days worth of data. Um, but um, actually we can set it as we would like to over time, where we're looking at uh, effectively a density map of an individual's experience of glucose at different times of the day um, over the, uh, the defined time period. And I think it's important to remember what it is we're trying to do in a consultation um, around glycemia, because of course the consultation may not be about glycemia, um, but if it is, when, then we tend to take this sort of broad focus and then ever more detailed focus in. And so initially we want to get an idea of an overview. So overall glucose control, is it appropriate to minimise long-term risks? Are there major issues that we need to be aware of? And I think uh, we then tend to look at this issue of range extremes, so specific hypo or hyperglycemia problems, ketoacidosis, admissions with severe hypo, et cetera, et cetera. We then tend to look a little bit more at the detail of that in relation to the um, parts of the day that are important or the pattern that we see that repeats um, or that doesn't repeat and what risks may associate with that pattern. And of course, oftentimes we'll be in a consultation very specifically to look at individual problem solving. And an individual problem solving, for example, for an episode of very severe hypoglycemia may be something which we can uh, impact upon by looking at the overall, but it's much more likely that we'll need to look at the specific detail in that respect. So and, and in that perspective, we would have to look at different parts of the profile. When we're looking at the overview, we can be looking at the hemoglobin A1C if we want to do that, or the estimated A1C or G, uh, glucose management indicator, as we're now meant to be calling it, uh, which, of course, is a measure of the mean plasma glucose. And, of course, time in range. I'm trying, going to try and say not too much about time in range because obviously there's going to be a full tutorial on that um, in a week or two. When we look at extremes, we can look at the range above and the range below target episodes that are clearly going to be important in that episode. And when we're looking at the issue around patterns, the AGP is where it really comes into its um, fore, I think. Uh, and then when we're looking at individualized processes, we're looking at individual day profiles. And of course, all of those can be found from CGM data, which makes it a very powerful way for us to look at all of the issues around glucose uh, management that we might be interested in. So I think what's important to recognise is that a full assessment of someone's glucose experience. Uh, on the left of this slide, we've got um, data relating to the consensus statement around what the uh, indices that we're looking at uh, and where we see those as ideal and acceptable. And on the right, we've got this, this idea of the standardised report. You won't be able to read the details of the standardised report, and that's not important for this, because what I want to do is just point out where things are on it. So first and foremost, with any data interpretation process, is that we must make sure that what we're interpreting is valid data. So is it valid to be looking at it? And the validity data comes from the top left-hand box on these reports. We're then going to look at this idea of summative metrics. So we're either looking at this idea of the GMI or the estimated A1C, for, if you want to use the old fashioned term for it, uh, glucose variability and time in range indices. Then we have this whole range of visual uh, metrics that we're looking at, which we can see from a summary from the ambulatory profile and indeed then from individual days. So we have a one page report that, if you like, brings potentially all of those things together, although we may still want to be looking in more detail at specific parts of it uh, during the consultation. So it's a good place to start, essentially. And I think um, the other thing that's important to remember is that the visual representation of good diabetes control is this uh, picture here, which is where the majority of someone's experience using their AGP profile 
fits into this 3.9 to, to 10 millimole target range. And I think that's a really important one to recognize because it's always by comparing back to this image that we are going to be looking at the types of therapy change that we might be advising. So in order to consult with data, we first of all have to make sure that the data um, is available to be consulted with. And I think what's important for us to recognize is that anybody who uses the Freestyle Libre system with their phone, which I think in the UK now represents somewhere between 70 and 80% of Libre users, they already have their data stored online and it can be viewed by them using the same password and login that they have for their phone app at the LibreView.com site. Um, and by us, if they choose to share their data with us in a, in a healthcare professional um, version. What's interesting, uh, and I still find this uh, almost incredible, is that the majority of people using their phones to look at their data don't actually know that their data is online and in a cloud server already. Um, so I think that's a very important thing to make sure they do know, because I think that the power of the data looking at it on a big screen on a computer is so much greater than just looking at those last few hours on a phone. And I think I therefore would always encourage people to view their own data by logging in at LibreView.com. And if it's somebody that I haven't met before and they're not um, terribly um, au fait with systems, then I will, if I'm talking to them, say, well, do you mind if I log into your data if they haven't yet linked up um, their data to a, to a hospital account? And of course, the easiest way of doing that is just basically to log in with their username and password, which I think is a one-off in a, in, a, in a first consultation if someone's using a device is a perfectly reasonable thing to do, but clearly from the longer term perspective, um, is much better to do it with a linked account. So in that first consultation, although I will look at their data with them, perhaps logged in as them, I will also aim to, sh aim to set up the sharing link with them during that first consultation if they haven't already been able to do that themselves. And to make sure that I've shown them the possibilities that are available on LibreView rather than just on their phone. And I think that the other thing to find out with a first consultation um, with data like this is to make sure which of the data representations chimes for the individual whose data we're looking at. Because I think that's really important to make sure, although I may have data images that I prefer to look at and prefer to use, they may mean most, or some of the ones that may mean most may be different for the person with diabetes who, we're, who I'm talking to. And so knowing which ones they find the most meaningful makes an important impact in terms of how I can be effective in consulting with the data. So I mentioned um, earlier on, I'm not planning to talk very much in theory about um, the AGP today. And I'm going to assume perhaps that most people um, listening to this uh, talk have already had some input with that, but, uh, but just as a quick advert, if you haven't, there are free online educational modules um, at the web address on the screen there, which are available to anybody uh, working in the NHS, um, free of charge, simply as a download um, that you can look at yourself, and which go through the details from quite basic and, and in terms of uh, looking at data through to the, the more complex processes of, of what the AGP can offer. So I'm planning not particularly to try and repeat bits of this, because this is going to be, as I say, a fairly specific um, few minutes talking about um, LibreView. So getting to know LibreView. So easiest thing in the world, we put a web address in. And when we put a web address in, this is the screen that we are addressed with, which is a login screen. Um, the issues on the screen around looking at patient or professionals don't take you to sites, they take you to information. This is an informational screen. To get to any um, detail, you actually have to either log in or create a new account through the sign up process. Having logged in, um, and this is, I've logged in as a healthcare professional, um, this is the screen that we face. And I think it always starts in this screen, which is the screen that is intended for data upload. And there are two ways that data can be uploaded. 
one to create a if you like an anonymous report from upload which i think if you are doing it from a healthcare professional environment is a is a potentially reasonable way to upload data um, and the other is to create a report that links into an account that's already available i think there are some challenges in a healthcare provision environment in using the linked patient uh, upload option because we're pushing data through a firewall which then becomes potentially insecure and if it's got patient identifiable information on it we do need to be careful about that everybody's own healthcare environment will have their own views about whether that's something that is or isn't um, an ideal approach i know for example in my own hospital that's not something that they're keen for us to do so, and in fact the majority of our patients we therefore ask to upload from home and we're just viewing data uh, when they're in the hospital um, I would uh, point out uh, that th there is a flash at the top of this screen, um, which is something that's worth looking at because this is a program which is in evolution. And so release notes do mean that there is a change to the program. Um, I deliberately left this one up. Actually, there hasn't been a change probably for about the last couple of weeks now. Um, uh, or perhaps we need a bit longer than that. Um, but as I say, it's important to recognise when there are release notes to have a quick peep at what the changes are so that you don't get confused by them. So if we take a step on, and I'm now going to just look at what the um, issues around the menu screen are, which is challenging because my little window with people's faces on is in front of it. Um, we have a number of options in the in the menu screen and if we look at the, the first option that we have is this idea of changing preferences on a report and i think that is worth having a quick look at because there are many ways in which we can look data look at data we can select which of those ways of looking at data we like to see routinely so we can uncheck boxes and we can order the order of, of reports and so i i tend to look at overview data first and then look into um, the individual day data, looking at the weekly summary, then the daily log. And then um, we'll look into some of these other details a little bit down the line, but we'll talk about each of the screens in, in, in more detail in a moment. So back to this one. The other thing that we can also do, and I think is a really important place to know it, is, is to say, is to look into the My Practice data on the program, because the My Practice data on the program shows you this number. If you are ever hoping to get patients to share information with you, this number is important. This is a, a one-off number. This happens to be the number, obviously, for my own practice at Queen Alexandra Hospital. But this is the number that individuals will need to know if they're going to share data with you. And it's in the program. So it's not something you need to be able to remember and learn off by heart. It's already there and waiting to be used. Uh, the other thing I think is worth looking at is the button right down at the bottom here, the customer support button, um, because actually there's an awful lot of information in that. And it isn't, doesn't mean that the only customer is a um, person with diabetes. The customer can be the healthcare professional as well. And there's a fairly wide range of professional support options in terms of um, that can both help you as an individual using the software, but can also help your IT team um, when they're looking at it and setting it up if, if, if you have an online account that needs to be set up in, in a hospital environment. So in the first um, one talk in this series, um, one of the topics that Pratik was talking about was this idea of trying to prioritise individuals for being seen in clinics based upon either metabolic or other uh, risk profiles. And this is one of the um, slides that he used. And I was just wanting to sort of try and link them together because, of course, one of the options that we have through um, LibreView in the clinic list view, which of course is specific to the healthcare professional version of the software, is that we can look down uh, an entire list of um, patients to see what um, the issues are. And on this list, I have selected here some things probably that I shouldn't have selected because I selected a date of birth, which makes it um, a non uh, or an identifiable English issue, which is why I've blanked it out here. Um, but you can see who's how recently is the data come. So we can immediately see that there is a problem with this person's device because apparently they most had their most recent data in 2025. 
um, an ongoing problem with all technology. Uh, clearly, if if this is a if if this is a, has date and times misset, but we can look at a wide range of of issues. And when we want to prioritise individuals within our clinic, there are a number of ways that we can do that. The first way is that we can set flags within the clinic list. And if we set flags within the clinic list, we can set flags either for people who are using or not using their device properly, however how many times they're testing it, and we can define the numbers we want to look at in terms of um, in finger stick tests or, in, or scanning results or people with a glucose average above a certain level. And these will all then be flagged within the uh, patient list if we wish to do so. I have to say, this isn't particularly the way I tend to look at data when I'm, when I'm looking for uh, issues like this. What I tend to do is to use the columns at the top here, which you can set yourself. Um, and you can see that I've set myself to have eight columns. You'll see this is slightly different because I've realized that I shouldn't have had the date of birth in it. So I've taken the date of birth out of these columns. But you, on any of the columns, you can arrange the data in the column by that value. So, for example, here we've uh, ranged our data for the whole po clinic population, which in uh, our clinic is in the region of 600 uh, people now. Uh, and we've done it by their estimated A1C. And so we can see the people with the worst glucose control at the top. And those, in ter certainly in terms of critiques messages, would be the ones we'd be looking to see soonest. We can also look at it above specific hyperglycemic episodes. Now, there'll obviously be some trade-off between A1C estimates and specific episodes. And we can also look at, look at it for individuals who have dramatic problems with hypoglycemia, so the percent below the target. And again, we can see that this person's data, um, who apparently has 100% below the target, um, is actually erroneous data, again, through a um, meter miss set. But once we start looking at them, we can start then seeing in more detail where, where, where the people with specific problems lie. Um, one of the ones that I like to look at, and, and you'll see that I've done another thing here, is I've changed the time period. I've changed the time period here to 30 days and looking at those people because those people who've managed to capture 100% of the data over 30 days really know how to use these devices well. So that then means I'm not worried about the way they're using the device. And what you'll generally see is that the number of people who capture data well and the number of people who are also doing fairly high numbers of scans in an individual day. But I think you get the idea of this idea of if you want to look for specific issues, you can use the clinic list as a whole and drill down within that to look at problems. But of course, in a consultation, what we're much more likely to be wanting to do is to look at an individual's data. Um, and of course, that's the third way that we can select to look at data here, which is by typing a name in. And then if that name exists in our clinic list, it will pull it up. Um, Sadly, it's impossible to pull up data like this without um, having a name there. So you have to all ignore this. This is not a person with diabetes. This is one of the nurses from our clinic uh, process who kindly um, wore a sensor so that we could use her data for this demonstration. Um, once we go into an individual's data, I think it's important to recognize that we can look at their profile, which will include both some demographic details, but will also tell you how they're using the device. So this person is connected to LibreView patients, so we know that they're using their phone to do that, and that she's also linked up to the practice already. This is a very important piece of information that most people aren't aware is there. If you wish to, you can download all of the data from an individual's LibreView file into a specific uh, comma separated values file that you can download onto your own machine to use elsewhere. Now this is important because of course, until you download any data, none of the data is actually sitting on your hospital machine. It's only sitting in the web server and you're just viewing data. As soon as you click that button, you then have a responsibility for making the, sure that the data is safe and that in terms of how you're storing it. Uh, so it's not a button we use very often, but people often say, oh, I'm wanting to put things into a different, how, how do I get my data out of LibreView? That's the button to do it. But of course, what we're mostly interested in in a clinic is looking at what's going on with the glucose levels. And so what I'm going to quickly do is, is run through, you will see this person has only worn a sensor once, which she did in the month of June. Um, if she had worn a sensor more continuously, you would see a wider number of these profiles, which are done in two-week intervals. 
And so you can use those up and roll, scrolling up across the page to actually see whether there is any significant change over time. Um, but of course, we can also go into the specifics of the data for any particular one of those dates. And so we click glucose reports and we bring into this screen. And of course, this screen will then start to look at the data in terms of the, the, the way that you've ordered it in your report setting. And here we are now with the more detailed so-called AGP report screen. Now, a quick aside, which is uh, my own personal views um, of these are sat in the orange boxes alongside the data here. And um, this report wasn't one of the things that was originally in LibreView and has been added in April of this year. It's been added because it's the, re it's the recommendation of the time and range consensus group. And all of the figures that are on this um, view are calculated in exactly the way that the time in range consensus group recommended that they should be set. Now that's important to recognize because some of those calculations are slightly different than the way the calculations were done previously. Um, and as we'll see that potentially, unless you know that that difference is there, it could confuse you in a consultation uh, if a patient asks you a challenging question about data which you are unable to answer. So this is a subsequent add-in, and I say we'll look at the, the, this in a bit more detail as we go through some of the examples a bit later on. Um, if we look at the snapshot data, um, this gives you a number of issues. It gives you a very quick overview of what the AGP is going to look like, although just with the 10th and 90th centiles. It tells you an average glucose level, percent in target range, percent below target range. I say this is somebody without diabetes, so the numbers are as you would expect. It can give you um, some idea of low glucose events, and that's in terms of this, it's, it's fixed at being the below three event, um, because that's what it's been defined at on the program. Um, and it can give you an idea of how effectively this person was wearing the sensor over the two week period, how much of the data was captured, how many scans on average were they doing a day. So this is primarily a screen which is used as a validation tool for the data, say, am I looking at the right data? Is it the right person? Is it effectively been collected? Uh, the next one is the daily patterns uh, view itself, which is the amberylatory glucose profile. So the median 25th, 70th, 75th percentiles and the 90th and 10th percentiles over whatever the time period that you select. The standard is that this should be a two week data collection period. Uh, and I think that makes sense for most of the clinical applications that we would look at. Although very occasionally you might want to reassure yourself that things are running well over a long period of time. So you can set, um, as you'll see in a moment, the report setting to give you a much longer setting if you wish to. The weekly view summary shows you each day as an individual line. The dots on the line show you, or the open dots on the line rather, show you the um, times that the meter has been scanned during the collection period. If there were closed dots on the line, those would be um, glucose data that was collected separately from the, the Libre view um, on, the, on the finger strip element of a reader. Um, and it allows you, I think, quite usefully to do a quick comparison across the day, across a week to say, are there particular days where the pattern looks different for an individual in, a, in terms of focusing on? If you want more detail of an individual day, then you can go into the individual day logs. And although this person has only got glucose data on the individual day logs, if the person has been putting the flags in around meal times, insulin doses, carbohydrate intake, it all appears on the daily uh, log. The monthly summary, I think, is a useful page to go to. If you're not being able to see the data you think you should be able to see, um, it's always useful to go to the monthly view. The monthly view, it will generally show you a month before and a month after the time period that you've um, said that you're interested in. Uh, so it gives you, it makes you clear, for example, that actually if I'd set the date from the 1st to the 11th of June for this person, I would have been looking at um, days when she wasn't wearing the sensor and I would have missed a lot of, off a lot of them. So it tells you exactly when it's appropriate to look at it. And of course, you also see from the um, monthly summary view when someone changes a sensor. So if you're worried about that first day issue with sensors, as some people are, you can see which the first day is from the calendar view there. This screen is a screen that's there in, in lots of CGM um, 
data presentations um, and uh, actually this is how it appears for most people because unless people are really good at logging their meal times and their carb intake and their uh, insulin doses effectively this screen doesn't show very much when people are good at logging it can be a really useful screen um, and i think from my own perspective the way that most people do logging effectively is when they're actually using the data for example in a bolus calculator um, as they go along which means they put the data in which also means that we get this mealtime patterns view effectively um, at the moment um, the bolus calculator that's within um, the software isn't um, available for the LibreView data on its own. So if they are logging it, they'll be logging it in a, in a third party app, most likely. The last um, view option is this one called the Pattern Insights option. And the idea of this is it, it, it takes um, an AGP like um, display and applies maths to the data within it to try and look really at three elements. The first of which is, is the average glucose in a target range that they're aiming for? The second is, does it look that there is, as if there is a risk of low glucose in that particular um, target period? And the third is, how variable is the trace? Now this is someone without diabetes, so clearly they don't have any variability. Um, their median glucose is clearly not going to be elevated at any point. So that if, if you like, this is about high sugar, this is about low sugar, and this is about how variable glucose is. And I think that idea of high sugar, low sugar variability is something that is an important message. Although my own personal view of the mathematics related to this is that the traffic light system isn't an immediately in uh, sorry, intuitive system. Um, and sometimes if you're using it you'll find yourself trying to explain why a traffic light was orange rather than red and i think once you get into that it's some kind of a dead end consultation process <clears throat> so i personally don't tend to use this screen very much um, and indeed what that means is if i don't want to use the pattern insights i can just tick off that box so that i won't be using it at all but perhaps more importantly is to say, given that I have this wide selection of, of screen options, it's really important to make sure if I'm going to use more than one screen option in the analysis, that they are all set to the same time period. If you have one set to one time period, one set to another time period, then it can become problematic when you're trying to um, interpret data from them. So I think it's always important to check at the beginning of a, of a session in particular that those are set to at the same time period if you can. You can also, um, if in doubt, um, make sure that, that by, by checking what the report end date is this, it defaults to this idea of saying the most recent upload data is what it's going to look at. So if someone's using the phone, it'll be pretty much continuous. If someone is using the reader or is uploading uh, separately, then it'll be just that most recent upload. So if you want to look at a specific time, you can select by a specific date rather than just by the most recent upload. And you do so with this bottom corner button. So that's my quick tour. And what I'd like to do is just to sort of work that quick tour into the idea of taking um, a principled approach to data. And I think I say the broadly the stress and data analysis are first of all, validating the data. Second, describing the data. And only once we've validated it and described it, do we then try and make this interpretive process. And so I think what I want to do is to carry that principle, those set of principles through to the idea of looking at an individual person. Now, I can't show full screens because I can't completely anonymize people um, when I'm showing real data on a full screen. So I have to take screenshots like this. Um, so this is an individual who has been using um, Libre for actually the best part of three years now. Um, and the first thing you can see just when you're looking at her uh, glucose login profile is that there's something wrong with the way she's using it. So we've got large gaps in data, but we can see that, for example, even though we've got a large gap in the data, she did have it on 93% of the days 
in that particular period that we were looking at. Um, and on this most recent period, she had it on three quarters of the days, but we've hardly got any data there at all. And I'm going to look at this one in a little bit more detail to pick that apart. Because when we look at the snapshot view for this lady, we see that it's what she's measuring is high. But when we come down to this one about sensor use, she's generally only scanning this once a day. This is not, you'll be pleased to hear, somebody who is uh, using this as an NHS user. She self-purchases, but she self-purchases and doesn't use it very often. And in fact, from this graph, you can tell an awful lot about the way she uses it. And I'd just like to therefore focus in a little bit on that graph. So what this tells us, the fact that the line gets up to three quarters of 75% tells us she must be having it on at least 75% of the days of the period that we've been looking at. Each time you flash the sensor, you get the time of flashing it, <coughs> excuse me, and the eight hours before. So what that tells us is that she pretty reliably scans it at about seven o'clock in the morning when she wakes up three quarters of the time, but then scans it almost no other time of the day. So she's using it as a once in the morning test rather than a continuous profile, which is why we're lacking so much data. So I think this data pattern therefore is quite different to this data pattern which is a mocked up one, you can see, because the colors are different, so I've just done some drawings. But so this person is also not capturing very much data. Looks as if they're doing two scans a day, but actually this very flat pattern across the day and a low data capture is what you see if you're looking at the wrong period of time. So in other words, <coughs> if this person wore the sensor for 14 days, you're just looking at half of it and you've got the date setting wrong. So I think low capture, but a flat line across the day is generally a, I've got the date settings wrong for the period of time that I'm looking at. And I think that's a really useful thing to be aware of, but the, that difference in, in, in um, sensor usage. So having in validated five the data, minutes. Like, okay, how are we going to interpret it? And of course, the principles around, around that, we'll talk about time and range stuff first of all. And I think time and range makes a very good overall view of data interpretation. Um, if the time and range targets are good, then the consultation around glucose is specifically driven by, is there anything that the person with diabetes wants to discuss, in my view? Because if I'm trying to change it when it's already good, I'm just as li likely to make it worse rather than better. If, however, it's not, then I think what we have is this three-step process where we're going to define the pattern that we think is going on and then look at AGP and daily traces to try and work towards solution to improve things. And I think, uh, if you remember, I said we need to look at low glucose risk, high glucose risk and variability risk. And I think those are entirely appropriate. And if I've got time and I'm aware, Ramsey, that I am running a little short on time, um, I, I'm, I'm going to um, quickly one run through an example of each. So the first of all of this issue about somebody with hypo risk. So you'll see these are fairly recently made slides because it was up to yesterday that this person's um, profile is running. Uh, this is the first third of his AGP report. And what we can see when we look at it in detail is he's got fairly high glucose variability, but he's also got 20, what's that, 21%, uh, if I can add up, yes, 21% of the time below um, 4 millimoles, or 3.9 millimoles. Um, so what we generally see is when there is a lot of hypoglycemia, there also will be variability and obviously vice versa. But in this situation, I think this 21% below 3.9 clearly is the primary issue. And when we look down at this person's AGP, we can see that most of that low glucose, so that most of that 21% is occurring at a specific part of the day, is occurring in the overnight period. And I think the AGP is a really useful overall pattern uh, 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 adapter from that point of view because we can see it's happening in the overnight period we can see there's a small risk in the pre-lunch a small risk in the pre-evening meal but most of it is happening overnight the glucose level is falling most rapidly interestingly from about 10 p.m through to about midnight 
So there's something about evening meal and, and, and short acting dosing that goes with it. But this is a pattern as you might expect. And here's just confirmation of that from the profile saying overnight lows, pre-lunch lows, pre-evening meal lows. So this is very much a pattern of um, glucose that we see with a basal excess for an individual. Um, and we also see as is this is this pattern of uh, data loss is very common because obviously this is reflecting the fact that most people don't scan overnight and unless you scan at the last thing at night and the first thing in the morning you get a gap because you haven't scanned for more than eight hours so this is a very common pattern but this person was doing a lot of work looking at this and we can see that actually this confirms also the fact that this is a um, basal insulin problem, all of its lows are pre-meal and those post-meal ones are high. So this is a basal to bolus ratio problem and we've sort of worked that out from a single view. Um, so we can make a fairly specific pattern of what to do next and we can see actually to some degree he's worked it out himself in the last few days as well hasn't he? Although we can see that there's still the bolus dosing is still leaves something to be desired in this person. So I think at this point it's worth talking that there are some issues that, that can get confusing. The A1C may look, may be calculated differently on different views in the AGP because of the fact that they were produced at different times. The AGP can look different on different reports. That's a bit scary, but we'll talk into that. Um, and the AGP on the Pattern Insight report looks different again. Glu low glucose events can be a really useful, that little red, loops thing but what you shouldn't rely on in the low glucose events part of the graph is the y-axis scale so the exact how far it's dipping you can't rely on but you can rely on the fact that you've set a range saying if it's below that it's going to draw me a little red um, semicircle for it but how far it goes down you can't rely upon because the scale on the y-axis isn't consistent from one image to the next so why are there these changes and again it's down to this issue but it, that it's an evolutionary process this is actually the agp um, that's reported on the new um, profile which you'll see uh, actually uses different values than the standard agp so the 50 25 and 75 is the same but the 95 and fifth percentile is used rather than the 10th and 90th so this looks wider than this because this uses the 10th and 90th, this uses the 5th and 95th. My own personal view, 10th and 90th is better and I think I see things much more quickly on 10th and 90th. Which of those is going to win out long term? I think we will determine over time. This is the uh, so-called AGP view from the Patterns Insight view. The challenge and the reason this one looks different is actually because the time of the day is different on the setup. Um, so this starts at 3 a.m. So it is the same data, but just shifted by three hours to the right, which can also be confusing if you think you're looking at one and you're looking at the other. Um, this is the full view from that Patterns Insight. And what we can see is, is that according to the Patterns Insight, the risk of low is exactly the same across all the parts of the day because of the variability that's there during the day. But in reality, of course, the variability happens as a response to counter-regulation because of the lows occurring overnight. So I think we can do better than the traffic light just by eyeballing the data from information like this. Take a quick second example on hyperglycemia, and this will be quick. Um, what we can see this time is that we've clearly got over 80% above target range with 60 plus percent of it over the three at 13.9 very high um, and that's not surprising then when we look at a profile that we see pretty much all of the blue sitting up we see flatlining on the top of the uh, sensitivity for the data and when we look at the um, individual days on that profile although the variability here didn't look to be huge it's because the variability takes into account the average glucose level which is high and so there actually is still quite a lot of variability going on there but the relative variability to the average is lower because the average is higher um, and this is obviously a lack of both basal and bolus insulin for this person looking at variability again the numbers will look quite similar 
But here we see a very high percent CV target. We're aiming for it to be under 36, and we can see this is 60%. But of course, they do also, because they've got this very high variability with an average that isn't terrible by any means, um, they will also be experiencing some hypoglycemia. So their hypoglycemia values are more than you would hope for them to be. But I think this is the key issue that's the, the, the concern for this particular person. Uh, Ramsey will like this one and then I'm going to finish. So this is their um, overall and we can see hypoglycemia is spread pretty much anywhere across the day. They're quite good at capturing data. They're scanning data a lot, but there's an unusual pattern to their trace, which is doing quite well first thing in the morning when they wake up and through the morning. And then it all goes haywire from about lunchtime through to the small hours of the next morning. The actual profile looks like this. And, and we can see clearly that variability is the major issue here because th there's no way good control can be achieved with this degree of variability. Whereas actually this part of the day is doing quite well. What's the reason for this? Um, we get a hint, which is to say there are some days that are doing quite badly, but actually when you look towards the end, the variability drops right down. And this, will, this is a graphic example of uh, one of the pieces of information that Ramsey uh, has looked at in the past, which is it depends how the person is using the data. So this is four weeks worth of um, weekly profile. And if you just highlight a few of the days, the ones in orange, are the ones where there's been less than five scans a day, and in fact, often quite a lot less than five scans a day. And the ones in green are the ones where there have been more than 20 scans a day. And so this is a purely behavioral variability around the, when she's looking at it well, she does well. When she's not looking at it, she doesn't. So uh, an individual patient example of exactly that thing that Ramsey's um, population data has shown as well. So with that and in summary, I'll switch by saying I think that hopefully um, on my rapid tour of uh, the uh, LibreView software, um, it at least gives you an approach to it. And I say I think this, this approach looking at is it hypoglycemia or is it hyperglycemia or is it variability that I need to be focusing on on this mixed methods looking at um, time and range and some of the other validation metrics to get started, then the AGP, then the individual day profiles allows us to take this on very effectively. Um, I won't, I think screen sharing is a really important online part of uh, doing this, um, but how we screen share and, 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 and how we make that most useful, I think is something that we will um, no doubt have to learn for the future. And on that, I shall stop. Thank you very much, Ian, for a very clear and incredibly helpful presentation with all sorts of tips. So. I've had a, I had a few questions and I even had a few emails. So let me start because we don't have that much time. Um, one question was, how do you decide on the time scale? You touched upon this, but when do you decide that you go for two weeks, 30 days or 90 days when you're talking to the patient? So I, th I think some of the time scale is constrained by the software. So um, LibreView, and indeed, I think all, all of the Abbott software to date does the same thing, which unless there are five days worth of data available, it won't graph an AGP. So when you see what's meant to be an AGP and there are gaps in it, all it means is that there haven't been five repeating days worth of data at that particular part of the day. So the closer to five days you select, the less likely you are to see an AGP in, in terms of data missing. And of course, the longer the time period you select, the more likely you are to be seeing changes that are happening over time rather than changes that are something that you're looking to make an, a, a, an impact upon. So what we know from blinded CGM research, and, and it has all been blinded CGM research, is that if you have 14 days worth of data, 14 days worth or 14 to 15 days worth of data uh, gives you about an 80 to 85 percent predictive value for what is going to happen in the next two to three months if you don't change anything. So because we've tend and I, and I think we tend from a from a visual perspective, if you put three months worth of data onto an AGP, you see a broad pattern with five lines that all look fairly horizontal because effectively the, the, um, 
detail of the data just gets trawled out by the fact that there is so much data there and you ends up becoming effectively just like a glucose average. So it's this trade-off between too little data to be confident about and too much data to have any sort of granularity to it, I think. So I say the, the research data suggests 14 is ideal from that. Yeah, so if I, if I just expand on that, I mean, I use it sometimes when we change therapy. So if somebody's treatment changed two weeks ago, we go for the 90 weeks, uh, 90 days data, and then we say, let's look at what happened in the past two weeks. Is that something that you use at all? So I, I think one of the things, and I, and I don't know if we've got any, any Abbott developers um, listening, one of the things that I think would be really useful is to, so if we have this idea that the AGP is an ambulatory glucose profile, is to look at something which is, if you like, a longitudinal profile, using the same parameters, so the median interdecile interquartile ranges but looking at on a daily basis so that you can take it back over time because i think what we often will want to do is to say if we're meeting with somebody on a three monthly basis for example we'll say well how's it going is it on the whole moving in the direction you'd like it to be moving or is it getting worse or is this last two weeks bad whereas until then it was going pretty well yeah. and i think this idea of being able to pick longitudinal and i think this is this is why it's important to use that screen the only way you can do it easily at the moment is on the when you first log into the individual patient and you'll see that screen and you can scroll down the two week profiles to see whether there is any significant change over time with them um, but I, I think that is a clunkier view than we'd probably ideally like so i'm, I'm hoping that someone will develop that i've even made a few suggestions but whether they'll be taken up who knows so the, the next question is is quite practical and important is that once the patient registers does that mean that they are sharing their data all the time they no so when they're registered they create effectively it's like creating their own dropbox account so they're creating an account to which any data that they have from their phone will go to that account so they can't stop it uh, other than by wrapping their phone in a lead lined box or something, they can't stop the data from getting to the cloud account because that's an integral part of the way that the data is collected. Um, the cloud account, however, is private and personal to them and it requires their password and their login to access it. But what they can do is they can permit a healthcare professional or we can invite them to permit us by sending them uh, an email through the system if we know their email address um, to share that data so we can look at it as well as them. Now, in practice, of course, what will often happen is that we're the people looking at that data and actually what they're looking at for the most time is just what's on their phone. And I think I say that for me, the value of the consultation in terms of being able to look at data over a longer period of time and discuss it with the lived experience of the person is, is actually what potentially makes a remote consultation really powerful with this type of data. So, so once they share with us, then once they agree to share, then we can access their data all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So the, access, the data then becomes available to us all the time unless they decide to stop sharing it. Yeah. Now, of course, what that means is if they've gone on holiday to France, if they have a problem whilst they're on holiday in France and they ring in and say, I'm really worried what's going on, you can see what's going on. So yeah. some people like that, but I think you know, how we use that power of being able to see the data, I think is one of these, what I always have is a conversation with people who says, I'm not going to look at your data unless you ask me to, or unless we're planning to have a, an appointment. Well, I mean, for, for the record, I never had a problem with any patient saying, I don't want you to look at the data. They're all delighted that we are looking at the data. So the, the next question was uh, the practical use of estimated A1C and GMI. Do you use it clinically? Is it useful? So I think, I think that we've, as clinicians, I think we probably put a little bit too much store in the measured A1C for individuals, because actually we know that there's this enormous number of parameters that can impact upon what the A1C actually is. Um, I think I think the the challenge around that is what we the reason we wanted an A1C is we wanted an average glucose equivalent. Now, the thing that I find challenging is that of course when we have continuously monitored data, that we actually have the average glucose. So for me, knowing the average glucose, particularly if the average glucose is is stable over a three month period, is actually a more powerful piece of information than knowing their A1C which of course may be impacted on the fact by their 
got increased red cell turnover, their iron deficient or whatever. Um, the calculations have changed, um, and the reason, and, that, and that's the reason why, on two of the reports, if you the, if you go back when you get the uh, uh, download from this, you'll see that on that first patient that I was describing, um, the A1C on the two reports is actually reported as a slightly different value, and that's because the old style EA1C, as it was called. Um, was calculated on a, on, a, on a reverse correlation of maths, which apparently mathematically is a bad thing to do. Whereas the new version, which is this GMI um, measurement, um, has a new calculation process, which is more valid. But don't ask me to explain the maths because I'm not entirely sure I understand the maths. So, so can, can I just add to this? <laughs> um, I've been lucky enough to be involved in, in a piece of work with Abbott where we describe a new marker called calculated A1C, which is person specific. So it takes mm. into account the red cell lifespan. Because if you think about it, if you have a short red cell lifespan, you can have an artificially low A1C, so you under treat. If you have a long red cell lifespan, you'll have an artificially high A1C, you over-treat and you're predisposed to hypoglycemia. So just watch the space. We published one paper on this, but there should be some more coming out. If anybody's interested, just drop me an email and I'll send you the paper. Right, we've got what, time for one last question, was about basal and bolus insulin ratios. So how do you see the basal bolus insulin ratios in terms of insulin pump and MDI. Uh, I mean, the question was, is it still sort of 70-30 like you do with the mixed insulin? So, uh, no is the answer. But, so, for, for, uh, I think there has to be a cautionary preface to any answer to this question, which is, of course, it varies from person to person um, uh, because different people's lifestyles are different. But in, in practice, for most people um, who have a standard... 150 to 250 in, in carbohydrate intake a day, grams of carbohydrate a day. Um, using MDI insulin, um, ratios that are close to a 50-50 ratio seem to work well. For those people who use more frequent bolusing, and of course that's almost the norm when you come to people using insulin pumps, um, who may be using five, six, seven, eight boluses a day, although some of them may be very small. Um, the ratio between background and, and bolus does change. And so we know that probably it's the sort of two thirds, one third, or even 75, 25 um, that on, on pump therapy in favor of the bolus insulin that will, that will work. And of course, the other thing that will impact that basal bolus ratio is actually the amount of carbohydrate you take in. So if you have, if you have someone who has a very low carbohydrate intake, the chances are that their basal will be relatively a little bit higher as a, a fraction of their total. Whereas if they have quite a high carbohydrate, and you know, lots of young, young men um, who are very physically active will have very high carbohydrate intakes in a day. And so they may have relatively a higher bolus um, requirement for insulin. So, but brush stroke 50, 50 MDI, or maybe 45, 55 MDI, and probably more like two thirds, one third, um, on pumps. Thank you very much, Ian, and thank you very much for everybody who contributed. Um, I hope that you found this experience quite enlightening, and 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 I, I personally quite uh, learned quite a bit. So I'm going to pass over to Hope now um, to conclude. Um, and thank you again, Ian. That was great. My pleasure. Thank you very much, uh, both Ian and Ramsey. That was really, really interesting. And I can see by the um, comments of thanks coming in that lots of people took a lot away from it as well. I'd also like to thank Abbott for kindly sponsoring this webinar. Thank you again, Ian and Ramsey. Thank you.